morning, everyone. Blessings to you. Shall we begin with prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the great gift of creating us as male and female in your image and likeness. The image and likeness of your own Trinitarian life. Life-giving love revealed through our very bodies as male and female. Open our hearts to the great mystery that Paul speaks about in Ephesians, that the union of man and woman in one flesh indeed is a great, profound mystery that reveals your eternal plan, Father, that we would be one with Jesus Christ. Help us to see that this great mystery, in fact, is stamped right in our bodies. Open our eyes to it. Jesus, you came preaching sight for the blind. If we are blind to the true glory of our bodies and our sexuality, speak your word with power to open our eyes this morning. Let it be. Let it be. Amen. Amen. I would like to begin with a little boast in the Lord. I have beautiful feet. Yes, it's true. I have beautiful feet. Where in the scripture does it say, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news? That wasn't really a question. I wasn't really asking where in the scripture. Although since I'm Catholic, you know, you can quote chapter and verse to me. It might help me out a little bit. Indeed, I have beautiful feet because I am here to proclaim good news of great joy. Good news about the meaning of our bodies as male and female in the image of God. Good news about the deep, yearning, aching, longing desires we have in the depths of our soul for union, for love, for touch for intimacy. So often we hear growing up, maybe in our Christian homes, maybe in our Christian upbringings, we are taught that these things are bad, shameful, dirty. I am here to proclaim with the authority that Christ has given me as his brother, baptized in his death and resurrection, that those ideas that our bodies are bad tainted, dirty, evil, that our desires for love, for union, for touch, the idea that that's evil, I am here to proclaim that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. And that lie, in one way or another, to one degree or another, has worked in all of us to keep us from the glory, from the union, from the love we truly desire. Look at our world. Look at the hunger in our world. What is every human being hungering for? Look at our culture and what we're watching on TV. What are housewives desperate for anyway? <laughs> and why can't Mick Jagger get no satisfaction? <laughs> this man tries, and he tries, and he tries, and he tries. But he can't get no satisfaction. I am here to witness to the love that satisfies. The love that has been hidden in the eternal exchange of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. But so often when we think of this idea, this love of God hidden in the Trinity from all eternity, it can seem like an abstraction. It can seem like just something that's far out there somewhere that's unreachable. I am here to proclaim that that invisible, eternal mystery of love has been made visible. John the Evangelist says, it is that which I have seen with my eyes. It is that which I have touched with my hands that I proclaim to you concerning the word of life. How, how, how could John see with his eyes the love of God? How could John touch with his hands 
the love of God. How is it that that eternal, mysterious love of God was made present to him, tangible to him, something he could see and touch and enter into? How did it happen? In the fullness of time, that love took on flesh. That's what we mean when we speak of a theology of the body. Incarnation. God's mystery has been made visible in the flesh. Theology of the body. Theology, obviously, the study of God, yes? But we tend to have theology here and our bodies way over here, don't we? You know, when I throw out the word theology, what comes to mind? Just, just rattle off what's coming to mind when I say the word theology. God, spirit, what else? Maybe a crusty professor or something? <laughs> Okay. When you hear the word theology, you do not think body, do you? And when you hear the word body, I'm not sure I even want to know what comes to mind. <laughs> but people, when they hear the word body, they don't go, theology, do they? We don't tend to have these two words together in our lexicon, do we? In our vocabulary, do we? That is a tragedy. Theology of the body is the very logic of Christianity. Word made flesh. If we have theology over here and the body over here, a deep prayerful meditation upon the incarnation will bring these two realms beautifully together. And we will understand what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, the body is meant for the Lord and the Lord is meant for for the body. Our worship leader earlier, Mary Ann, she said, not only did Jesus redeem my soul, but then she went on to talk about all these bodily disorders that she had. And whether she knew it or not, she began proclaiming to us what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies. What is the theology of the body? It is a bold, compelling, biblical proclamation of sexual redemption to one and to all. I don't care what your struggles are. I don't care if you have been fornicating since the age of 12. I don't care if you're indulging in same-sex attraction and, and homosexual indulgence. I don't care what your struggles are. I am here to proclaim good news of great joy. I am here to proclaim sexual redemption. Yes, and this theology of the body that I want to share with you, this bold, biblical proclamation of sexual redemption, was developed by a Polish priest many years ago. His name was Karol Wojtyła, otherwise known to the world as John Paul II. I would like to share with you something that Alan Medinger, how many of you are familiar with Regeneration Ministries? I have his newsletter here. And I'd like to share with you what happened to him when he encountered this Polish priest's teaching known as the Theology of the Body. And for those of you who don't know Alan, he has been working for over a quarter century with the sexually broken. This is a man immersed in the Word of God and sharing sexual redemption with others. But he says this, at this point in my ministry, after over 25 years, I can think of no greater service to render my fellow evangelicals than to point them to John Paul II's theology of the body. In fact, he says, I believe it could be the most important teaching on human sexuality in our time. The teachings are biblical through and through. Just as an aside, this Theology of the Body, it's a collection of 129 short talks that John Paul II delivered, not just for Catholics, but for Christians around the world between 1979 and 1984. Alan Medinger says, biblical through and through. In fact, I've tallied this up. In these 129 talks, John Paul II reflects on over 
1,043 different verses of Scripture to paint for us a beautiful, glorious, <coughs> biblical vision that invites us into the banquet of God's love. It is a shift in discussion from thou shalt not eat out of the dumpster to come and rejoice in the banquet. The banquet of God's plan of love. That's the shift. A lot of us, I think, as Christians, we grow up in our Christian upbringings or maybe you weren't raised in a Christian home, but you heard other Christians talking about these things. And the general impression we got, this is what I got growing up as a Christian, when it came to God's plan for sex, all I heard was, thou shalt not. Dumpster bad. Dumpster evil. Don't go to the dumpster. Now, true enough, we shouldn't go to the dumpster. I have learned firsthand, like many of you have learned firsthand, that you can only eat out of that dumpster for so long before you start feeling nauseous, before you start feeling like you want to vomit it up. But I never knew growing up that God had a banquet that truly satisfied the hunger. That hunger we were talking about earlier, you know, why can't Mick Jagger get no satisfaction? This hunger we all have, it's in our movies, it's in our music, it's in our poetry, it's in our TV shows. Bruce Springsteen sang about it. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Katie Lang sang about it. Constant craving has always been. That is a craving for the banquet. That is a craving for the love that truly satisfies. And this biblical vision lays it out for us. I continue from Alan Menninger. The teachings are biblical through and through. John Paul II has taken the most fundamental passages relative to sex, marriage, manhood, and womanhood, and he has explored them with a depth that made me, he admits, Someone who has ministered and written in the area of human sexuality for over 25 years, this theology of the body made me feel like I was just entering college. The scriptures around which much of the teaching is centered are just the ones you'd expect to find. Created male and female. The two become one flesh. Be fruitful and multiply. Whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in the heart. But because the teachings take such a positive approach to our bodies and our sexuality, these passages came alive for me as never before. And when I read this theology of the body, I had the clear sense, Alan says, that this teaching was for all Christians, not just Catholics. I couldn't agree more. For the last 12 years, I've been traveling the world sharing this theology of the body, mostly to Catholics. In the last four years or so, <coughs> The Holy Spirit's doing something. What am I doing here? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is doing something. I've spoken at Focus on the Family. I've been on Focus on the Family radio. James Dobson just approved the sixth pillar that upon which Focus on the Family ministry is built on human sexuality. They had a new pillar, and it's on human sexuality. And... Guess who his staff called to help them build this sixth pillar? I humbly confess they called me. I don't know why. And this pillar that they put in their new platform, it's all drawn, whether they realize it or not, from John Paul II's theology of the body. God's doing something. I don't know what it is. The spirit is blowing and I'm just throwing up my sail and seeing where this boat goes. It's amazing. Let's come back to this phrase, theology of the body. What does it mean? We've already touched on it, but let's go deeper here. What exactly makes our bodies a study of God? As Christians, we are familiar with an emphasis on the spirit. We are not familiar, and sadly, we are often very uncomfortable an emphasis on the body. This split, however, when we put the spiritual reality over here and the physical reality over here, this split is a specific attack on Christianity itself. 
Because at the heart, at the center, at the core of the Christian mystery is the Word made flesh. Spirit and matter united. Tragically, many of us as Christians, we grow up thinking something like this. Spirit good, body bad. Admit, let me see a show of hands. How many of you would say you grew up thinking something along those lines? This is heresy. You know what heresy is? They are lies that come from the same place all lies come, the father of lies. And every time the devil lies, his goal is to keep us from Christ, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. How, according to John the Evangelist, do we recognize the Antichrist? He is the one who denies Christ come in the flesh. Be aware of all attacks on the body that would rupture the body from the spirit. We wear these glasses of dualism, which is a, means a rupture between the body and the soul, between spiritual and physical. And when we wear these glasses, we actually think Paul, for example, is confirming the evilness of the body when he says, live by the spirit and not by the flesh. Because the flesh is against the spirit. He is not saying spirit good, body bad. That's heresy. And the Bible cannot have heresy. It's impossible. God looked at everything he made. When he made us male and female in his image and likeness, he said, behold, it is very good. It is impossible for the body to be evil. If the body is evil, then the incarnation is blasphemy. So often Christianity is accused of demonizing the body. No, 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 no. Demons demonize the body. And then they blame it on Christianity. Christ took on a body, died on a cross, rose from the dead, ascended bodily into the divine exchange of the Father and the Holy Spirit as the Son. Do you know what this means? In traditional theological language, we call that a big phrase. Hold on. We call it the divinization of the body. That is the taking up of the body into divine life. It doesn't mean we're made God. God is God and we're his creature. But even Peter in his second letter says we are called to share in the divine nature. Our bodies are meant to be divinized, taken up by grace into the very life of the Godhead. And so Paul also says, the fullness of the deity dwells in Christ bodily. And then he says, we are called to share in that fullness. Huh. Christianity does not demonize the body. It divinizes the body. Paul is not saying reject the body in favor of the spirit. He's saying rather open the flesh, open the body to the indwelling of the spirit. So that what you do with your body will glorify God. How do we offer spiritual worship to God according to Paul in Romans chapter 12? I know a few chapters and verses, even as a Catholic. <laughs> How do we offer spiritual worship to God? Paul says we must offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. How does Christ breathe the Holy Spirit into his church? This is my body given for you. This is the profound marriage of body and spirit. It's called incarnation. It's also called Christianity. It's also called the good news of the gospel. And that's why I have beautiful feet. Puritanism is not to be confused with Christian purity. Puritanism says spirit good, body bad. Hugh Hefner said, I started Playboy magazine as a personal response to the hurt and hypocrisy of our Puritan heritage. 
Sex was taboo in Hugh Hefner's, quote, Christian home, end quote. Nobody talked about it. It was bad. It was evil. It was dirty. Hugh Hefner, as a young boy, like every young boy and every young girl, had a burning, yearning desire, burning, boom, 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 boom. Hugh Hefner had this burning, yearning desire, God put it there, to want to understand the body, the union of man and woman. Why did he want to understand this? Because as the scripture teaches, the union of man and woman is a great mystery, a profound mystery that points to Christ in the church. Every human being longs to know this mystery. Every human being longs to know this love. But when sex is bad, tainted, dirty, and evil, and we exchange Christian purity for a heretical puritanism, where do we go to satisfy that hunger? When the banquet is not proclaimed, we inevitably go to the dumpster. Why is porn a multi-gabillion dollar industry 50 years later? Because Hugh Hefner is saying here, the church didn't feed you, but I will. It is because of the silence of Christians. It's because, because of our failure. It is our failure to understand the word of God. It is our failure to understand the theology of our bodies. It is because of that failure that pornography flourishes. The hunger is not the problem. The problem is we're seeking to satisfy that hunger out of a dumpster. With something that never can satisfy. This is why Mick Jagger can't get no satisfaction. He tries and he tries and he tries and he tries and he can't get no satisfaction. The hunger, my brothers and sisters, is good. And John Paul II, this Polish priest, was anointed by the Spirit to proclaim this banquet to the world. Interestingly enough, he's a contemporary of Hugh Hefner. And he started developing this theology of the body right at the same time Hugh Hefner started printing Playboy magazine. So why have we heard much more about Playboy than we've heard about this theology of the body? Because there's an enemy who does not want us to know the theology of our bodies. Because if we come to know that our bodies are a sign here on earth of the eternal mystery hidden in God, well then our sexuality will launch us like a rocket into the stars and beyond. And the enemy knows that the main way to keep us from heaven is to invert those rocket engines. What would happen if you set off a rocket when the engines are pointed in the wrong direction? What's going to happen to that rocket? A massive blast of self-destruction. The good news of this biblical vision of sexuality is that if we let it sink in, it will very effectively redirect our rocket engines towards the stars. The problem is not the rocket. The problem is the engines have been pointed in the wrong direction. Let me illustrate more what I mean with a visual here. Let me find a little, here we go. Now, stretch your imagination here, and just imagine for a moment that this is the most beautiful painting you have ever seen in your life, okay? Do I hear some oohs? Do I hear some ahs? Okay, thank you very much. This is a painting of the crown of all of creation, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. This is a painting of Adam and Eve naked without shame in the garden before sin distorted it. Here's what sin, and here's what the enemy does to this painting. Crumples it all up distorts it so that we no longer see the goodness, we no longer see the beauty. And here is the classic blunder of religious folk. We encounter this distorted image, this distortion, this crumpled up painting, and we do this. We chuck it. We run away from it. Out of fear, perhaps. 
Maybe we've been so wounded by that distorted reality of our bodies and our sexuality that maybe even for a time we have to run the other way. Understandable. But if we do not eventually go back and reclaim what sin has twisted and distorted, we will never become the men and women we are meant to be. Hugh Hefner in 1950 did this. He picked this up and said, you shouldn't throw this away, you shouldn't throw this away, you shouldn't throw this away, and guess what? Was he right? Yes. yes. In a certain sense. Get this. If we take the scripture seriously about what it teaches on our bodies and our sexuality, we can actually agree and should agree with Hugh Hefner's diagnosis of the disease of Puritanism. We must agree, in fact. But if we agree with his diagnosis of the disease, where do we disagree and disagree radically? In the cure, precisely. He went from repression of all things sexual to the indulgence of all things sexual without experiencing the redemption of all things sexual. Hugh Hefner's right to pick this up and say you shouldn't throw it away. And he's right to call anybody who throws it away, in a certain sense, a hypocrite. Because we have all these hungers and thirsts and yearnings for it in there, but we just stuff, 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 repress, repress, repress. And then it explodes in all kinds of sexual falls. But Hugh Hefner is wrong to take this distorted image and just shove it in our faces. He just shoves it in our faces. He says, look at this, 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 look at this. That's his error. Here's what this compelling biblical theology of the body does for us. It says, yes, we must not throw this away. And in fact, dear Christian, let me show you what you just threw away. Let me show you through the power of redemption that all that has been twisted and distorted can be untwisted, undistorted, revealed yet again according to God's original splendor. This is the good news of the redemption of our sexuality right here. And yet, notice there are creases on the paper as I unravel it, yes? As I uncrumple it. That is actually biblically correct. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, did he still have his wounds? Yes, yes he did. But now, here's the good part. These wounds were shining with glory, radiating the very glory of God in his body, in his body, through his wounds. Those wounds were redeemed. Those wounds came to radiate the power of God. We so often spiritualize Christ. Christ is... After his resurrection, I am not a ghost. I am not a spirit. I am not an angel. I'm not merely spirit. Come, touch me. Angels do not have flesh and bones like I do. You don't believe me? Give me a piece of fish and I'll eat it. <coughs> Christianity is an incarnate bodily reality. It's not just the saving of our souls. It's the redemption of our bodies. <coughs> Let's do a blitz tour of the Bible here. Blitz, because I only have about 12 more minutes with you. A blitz tour of the Bible. I'm just going to go as John Paul II goes. Remember I said over 1,043 verses. Obviously I can't touch upon all that. <laughs> but I will give you just a brief highlight, an overview. He always begins with Jesus. Because Jesus is the center of everything. The center of the scripture is the incarnation. The center of the universe is the incarnation. The center of human history is when that little Jewish girl said yes to the angel and the word was made flesh in her womb. That's the center of everything. So we begin with Jesus. And Jesus, in fact, on his various occasions where he's teaching about God's plan for man and woman, from that center point, remember Jesus is the center of everything. From that center point, Jesus himself points us in two directions. Back to God's plan for man and woman in the beginning. 
or I guess you're looking at me and maybe I should go the beginning over here because you read this way, right? Okay, does that help if I do the beginning over here? Okay. Okay, the beginning over here. Jesus points us back to the beginning. The Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, hey, Moses allowed us to divorce our wives. What do you say, Jesus? Jesus says, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But in the beginning, it wasn't this way. In his discussion with the Pharisees, who didn't believe in the resurrection of the body, and they bring that scenario to, you know, the guy married this woman, and he died, she married his brother, he died, he died, he died, she married seven of the brothers. If the body's raised at the end of time, whose wife will she be? The Sadducees thought they had Jesus trapped. Jesus, this uneducated, so-called uneducated carpenter's son, says to these Jewish scholars of the word, you don't understand the word of God. Because in the resurrection, men and women are no longer given in marriage. We have a vision of this resurrection in the book of Revelation. Look at the two bookends of the Bible with me. The Bible begins in Genesis with the creation of man and woman and their call to become one flesh. It begins with marriage. The Bible ends in the book of Revelation with the marriage of the Lamb. Yes. The marriage of Christ and the church. You see, the whole point of this marriage in Genesis is to point us to this marriage in the book of Revelation. The whole purpose of the union of man and woman, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, the whole reason God made us male and female in the beginning and called the two to become one flesh, the whole reason for human sexuality is to point us to Jesus. Amen. To point us to Jesus and his union with the church. The whole point of the book of Genesis and the creation of man and woman, male and female, and their call to one flesh is to point us to our ultimate destiny of union with God in heaven. This is why Jesus says we're no longer given in marriage in the resurrection. Not because marriage is bad. Not because it's deleted. We don't get to heaven and God pushes the delete button. We get to heaven and God pushes the complete button. That is the sign that the union of man and woman was here on earth is now taken up and fulfilled. Fulfilled in the eternal marriage of Christ and the church. Do you know what this means? Do you know what it means? It means marriage and the sexual union of spouses as beautiful and wonderful as it is. And I'm the first to extol the true joys of married life. I, I love my wife and my kids more than any words can express. However, my dear wife Wendy is not and cannot be my ultimate fulfillment. God and God alone is my ultimate fulfillment. That's what Jesus is saying. You no longer need a sign to point you to heaven when you are in heaven. If Nashville is heaven, I don't know, am I close? Yeah. <laughs> if Nashville is heaven and everybody is on a road trip to Nashville, you'll see signs that point you there on the way, right? Nashville, 500 miles. Nashville, 100 miles. You will never see a sign in Nashville that says Nashville, zero miles. You no longer need a sign to point you to Nashville when you're in Nashville. The union of man and woman, right from the first moment of our creation, is a sign destined to point us to heaven. When we get to heaven, the sign gives way and we participate in the marriage of the Lamb. Whew. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, we see this biblical imagery used. The prophets speak of God's love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride. When Israel is unfaithful, she's accused of committing adultery against her bridegroom, Yahweh. The Song of Songs. How many of you have read the Song of Songs in the Old Testament? What is it? It is erotic love poetry, folks. And it is some seriously juicy stuff. <laughs> Don't believe me? Go read it. And if you have, like I have had in my own life, those strains of Puritanism within you, if you want that demon cast out of you, meditate on the song of the song. 
and that demon will be cast out. I promise you. It's the word of God. And you know what the Song of Songs teaches us? It teaches us among many other things. That eros, that Greek word we use for erotic love, the love of man and woman, sexual love, eros is meant to express agape, yes. divine love. That's what we learn. But just like we have theology over here and we have the body over here, so too do we have agape over here and eros over here. we got to bring them together. Husbands are called to love their wives. How? As Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church with agape. But he also, are you ready for a shocker? You know what we learned in the Song of Songs? It's all a foreshadowing of Christ in the church. Christ also loved his church with a purely, perfectly empowered eros. An eros that was inspired by agape. Now, we're not talking about sexual love here in the sense that we understand it. We're not bringing God down to the level of the base. No, we are raising up human sexuality right into the life of God where it is meant to be. Amen. Do you follow me here? Obviously, there's room for misunderstanding here. Jesus was a celibate. Okay, let's just make that clear. But on the cross, in a celibate way, in a virginal way, he is giving up his body for his bride. Which is why saints throughout Christian history have described the cross as the consummation of a marriage. Saints have described the cross, I kid you not, as a marriage bed. Mounted not in pleasure, but in pain in order to redeem our own pain. Where did Jesus perform his first miracle? At a wedding. And what did he do at this wedding? He restored the wine. The couple had run out of wine. Let's look at the biblical symbolism here. Now we believe this is a real miracle. Jesus was at the wedding. They physically ran out of wine. Jesus restored it. But there is always behind the physical reality profound spiritual truth. Let's try to get some of it out. What is wine a symbol of in the scriptures? The blood. And the blood is God's life poured out. His love outpoured. Wine in the scriptures is a symbol of God's love. His spirit. St. Paul says, and there I just betrayed that I'm a Catholic. I call him St. Paul. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm still trying to find the right language to convey this to my non-Catholic brothers and sisters, whom I love dearly. And I have learned so much from. So much from. See, this is the joy. This is the treat. This is what the spirit's doing. We need one another. I need you. I need your zeal. I need your love of God and the scriptures. I need it. And thank you for the witness that you are. Please, when you run into a Catholic who seems to just be following the rules, give him a gentle little <laughs> love smack. I call, I call it the love smack. Okay, Gentle, gentle love smack. But love him. Love him into a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Please. Please, we need it. We need it. Where was I? St. Paul. I was talking about, was talking about St. Paul. Okay, the Apostle Paul. You like that terminology. <laughs> I was talking about the Apostle Paul. And how he says, don't get drunk on wine, but get drunk on the Spirit. What did they accuse the Apostles of on Pentecost Day? They were drunk. What were they drunk on? New wine new wine. You see, in the beginning they were also drunk on wine of God. That's what enabled them to love rightly. That's what enabled them to be naked without shame. Because they saw in their nakedness the mystery of God's love revealed through their naked bodies. Theology of the body. It's stamped right in us. What's stamped in us? A call to holy, life-giving communion. A man's body doesn't make sense by itself, does it? <laughs> Gentlemen, have you ever wondered, standing there in the shower, why, oh God, did you make me this way? <laughs> Am I the only guy who's asked this question? <laughs> Ladies, don't laugh too hard. Your body does not make sense by itself either. 
But seen in light of each other, we discover the unmistakable plan of God, unless you're blind, that man and woman are destined for a holy, life-giving communion. And now I know there are some among us who struggle with same-sex attraction. But let me tell you this. Your body is the revelation of the deepest truth of your person and identity. And if your body is oriented towards the opposite sex, which it clearly is, then so is the deepest reality of your soul. It is sin that blinds us to it. You see, when they sinned, when they sinned in the beginning, you know what happened? They ran out of wine. What is lust? I don't care what form of lust you struggle with. What is lust? It is sexual desire emptied of God's wine. What did Jesus come into the world to do? Where did he perform his first miracle? He came to restore the wine that had run out in the sexual relationship. And if we drink deeply from this new wine, we will find ourselves inebriated on God's love. And it is that holy inebriation that the lovers are talking about in the Song of Songs when the bridegroom says to the bride, let's go into the wine cellar. But for lack of knowledge of this holy, glorious wine cellar, we settle for that two bottle, two dollar bottle that we get at the corner liquor store. We are here talking about wine that truly satisfies. Water that if we drink it, we will never thirst again. Food that if we eat it, we will never hunger again. And that food is Christ's body and his blood given up for his bride. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. What do we learn by looking at this grand biblical vision? We learn that God wants to marry us. Obviously, it's an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. God is not sexual. But our sexuality is meant to, meant to reveal this to the world. God wants to marry us. But there's more. Not only does he love us, not only does he want to marry us, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. You didn't realize, though, in second grade when you learned that little rhyme. And you can start if you want to do a little. We're going to wrap this up. You can. <laughs> People, this is good. We need the background music. It's great. You didn't realize, though. You see, we don't have this in the Catholic Church. I love it. I love it. Thank you, thank you. This is new to me. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll tell you what, sometimes this beats an organ, you know? I love the organs too. Where the heck was I? I don't even know. Not only does God love us, not only does he want to marry us, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? I don't know if you are. God wants to fill the bride with divine life. He wants the bride to conceive eternal life. And guess what? This isn't just a metaphor. We know there was a Jewish girl who gave her yes to the marriage proposal from heaven so totally, so faithfully, that she literally, literally conceived divine life in her womb. Theology of the body, the mystery is revealed through our sexuality. Isn't this what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5? For this reason, what reason? I'm getting chills, the music's awesome. <laughs> for this reason, for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. For what reason? To proclaim, to reveal to the world the great mystery of Christ's union with the church. God wanted this eternal marital plan to be so plain to us so obvious to us that he chiseled an image of it right in our bodies. And this is why the enemy attacks right here. Because the enemy is hell-bent on keeping us from the marriage of the Lamb. What better way than to attack the marriage of man and woman? 
I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've suffered. I don't care what your disorders are. Christ came into the world to give us this new wine. Please take up a study of this teaching called Theology of the Body. There are some books over here at the Resource Center. Theology of the Body for Beginners. I'd recommend you start there. <laughs> Another book, The Love That Satisfies, Reflections on Eros and Agape. If we as Christians, believers in our Savior Jesus Christ, if we can overcome the prejudices that so often exist between Catholics and Protestants, if we can listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, grow from one another, learn from one another, we will catch such a mighty catch in our nets that our boats will sink. Christ is preparing a new day. The pornographic revolution is almost over because you can only take so much before you start crying out for the banquet. The whole world is a mission field ready to soak up the true biblical proclamation of the glory of the redemption of our bodies and our sexuality. Let us pray. Let us pray together. Let us bow our heads and invoke the Holy Spirit for a new evangelization that would spread throughout the world with the same might and power that it did on that day of Pentecost when those first apostles opened to that wine from heaven and were drunk on the very love of God. Holy Spirit, we pray, come, come. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill your Bride with eternal life. The spiritual life that comes from your body. May this spiritual life reach our bodies so we can be a witness to the ends of the earth of the glory of God revealed through the body of Christ. Let it be. Let it be. Amen. Praise Him always. Thank you.